Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to do something a little different. We are going to go over some supplies and things that I wish I had known when I started that I wanted to share with you. So if you're a beginner just starting out, this would be a great information session for you. Or if you're an intermediate painter and are wanting to change things up and maybe some things aren't working exactly right for you and you don't know why, maybe some of this information will help you and guide you in the right direction. First thing I wanted to go over is paints. One of the things when I started that threw me through a loop was the paints. And when I first began, I was doing tutorials and I would get really honed in and focused on the paints that the artist was using. I wanted to recreate and mimic the exact feeling and look that the artist had created and I wanted to be able to show that exact feeling that I felt when I saw it. But what I wasn't realizing was that by being so exact on the colors, I was limiting myself in my color theory and therefore in my artistic expression. And it really stunts you when you don't have the freedom of making your own colors because that artist has created the color theory of that piece. And that is one of the reasons why it draws you in is because you see all of the complementary colors working together and you might not necessarily realize that that's exactly what's happening. By starting out with tubes of primary colors, you're able to create your own shades, your own values, your own colors. And when there isn't a color available to you right off the bat when you're doing a tutorial, you have the know-how and the confidence and the artistic expression to make your own colors and to say, I don't have that color, but let's look at using a color that is somewhat like it. And the beauty of the two paints is that they might seem a little bit more expensive. I haven't done the exact cost analysis of them. An intermediate tube, so a, a non-student grade tube, is going to run you probably $5 a tube. And so it might seem like a lot when you're starting out with three tubes at $15 when you probably can go buy a pan set with more than three colors for $15. But these colors will last you forever. Even when they harden just like this on your palette, they're still going to be usable. Uh, here's an example of a couple in particular that have just hardened here on my palette. And I can re-wet those anytime and use them. So they don't go bad once you take them out of the tube. They're there forever. So color mixing using tubes and not pan sets, I highly recommend. If it's in your budget to do more than three, then I would go with different shades of primary colors. The next thing that I wish I had known when I first started was paintbrushes. I've used so many. I first started with these Royal Langnickel brushes because I had them. These I had had in a set for a long time. I didn't have any detail brushes. So I had mainly the 10s, the 8s, the 12s, the 14s the flat brushes, the fan brushes. So I didn't have any of the smaller zeros, ones, twos, those detail brushes. So I did wind up buying smaller brushes, but, but beginning with these, these were great. And this is a relatively beginner friendly and expensive brand. You can find these in a lot of places. They're cost effective and they, they hold up really well. I mean, this brush now, granted I haven't been using it for a decade, but I've probably had it for a decade. The sizes that I would start with are really big ones, you know, a 10 or a 12. And then I would go to a large, meaning an eight or a 10, a medium, meaning a six or a four, and then a small, meaning a two, a zero, and then I like the detailed work, so I even have a two tenths. I have, and they go smaller than this. So this might seem like a really small brush, but they go smaller. So the outlying brushes that would also be good to have, but maybe once you've been painting for a while are like the 
spore bristle brushes, the ones that you can create the stippling with, the fan brushes, the angled brushes, those are gonna be ones that maybe when you're wanting a certain look for a flower or a card, then um, you can go out and get those. But I, I think basically a large, a medium, a small, and an extra small are really good brushes to start out with. And then the other important supply that I wish I knew a little bit more about was paper. And everyone always says that good paper really matters. And you know vaguely what that means because you know that copy paper isn't going to work. Um, you know that sketch paper is going to be hard to use. So you know you need a watercolor paper, but watercolor paper in and of itself is a higher quality paper. So to buy a watercolor paper and have it be not a good paper was kind of hard for me to wrap my head around until I started using them all. The ones that I have here are just papers that I have in my studio that I've kind of gone through just to try and test. The Canson Aquarelle paper. This is a 90 pound and you can see here how flexible it is and this is telling you of its weight. So this is a thinner paper. This is not going to hold up as well if you're wetting the entire paper and we're going to we're going to test these out. So you'll see firsthand how buckled this gets. And we're also going to take a look at them in reference to the colors and how well they hold up in that way. So this is a Canson cold pressed 140 pound paper and you can already tell how less of a bend it has. It's thicker. It still is a very smooth front for a cold press. If you think of the difference between hot press and cold press, it is just like you would think. If you hot press something, it's going to be very smooth, like ironing a shirt. It's going to be very smooth, very free of any kind of bumps or wrinkles, and that's what hot press is. Cold press has a tooth to it, and even the different sides are a little bit different on some of them. This is the Stonehenge 140 pound cold press paper. And I've kind of put these in order of what I would consider them to be lowest to highest quality. As far as denseness and what I look for in how the paper holds up with the paint. So here is a Stonehenge 140 pound hot press. So this is going to be very smooth. It has no tooth to it, meaning again that it doesn't have any ridges or bumps. And then this is a Strathmore 140 pound cold press paper. So you can just see how much more flexible the 90 pound is than the 140 pound. And again, I don't know if you can see this tooth, but it's just a more natural, almost like a handmade paper type feel where it's textured and rigid and ridged. So I'm going to tape these down so because we're going to get them all wet and we're going to test them all out. Okay, so to begin, I'm going to try and do a galaxy type scene. So we're going to be able to blend the colors on the sheet. So here we have our 90 pound Hansen cold press paper. And here I'm just kind of making you know, galaxy shapes. This is going to be our light color. We're gonna put these darker colors on top. This is kind of a dark green that I mixed up using all of the colors. So this one will be the dark around the light in the galaxy. So we're taking note of how the colors bleed with each other. And I don't know if you can see, but it's already kind of making like a little bump on the edge here. And when we peel off the tape, we'll be able to see it a lot easier. I'm going to try the same, pro I'm like tempted to wet all of this first, but I'm gonna try the same process. So we'll do some red here in the middle for our kind of lighter. And I think instead of 
this dark green, I'm gonna try the kind of tealy blue because green and red make brown and we don't want that. And to me, the difference between what I would consider a good paper and a not as good paper is just kind of like what's happening here where the color is just really sitting on top. It's not soaking in and that's kind of what one of the benefits of the 100% cotton paper is that it really soaks in the paint and gives you kind of a deeper, deeper sense of the color. Okay. Definitely in this one like how it's blended better than this one in the, on this side. On this stone hinge, we're gonna do this green because it's pretty vibrant. I think I'll do the same kind of darker green. Okay, so there's our first three types of paper. So this, these are the what I would consider the bottom three. Even though this stone hinge is good, I use it all the time. This would be probably one of the worst and you can see it's already buckling. It's just because it doesn't have the weight to withstand the amount of water used. So it buckles just like a piece of copy paper would it would just dissolve, you know? So it's kind of doing that in a less severe way. This one has a little bit, also a little bit of a ridge because this Canton is probably less cotton. It's hard to say. A lot of times they don't put that information on there. So if it is 100% cotton, it will say. And if it's not, it won't say anything about it. And then the Stonehenge one, it's definitely has um, what seems to be less bumping and bucklings. So here's the Stonehenge 140 pound hot press paper, which again, this one is the real smooth one. I don't use hot press paper very much, so we are going to be testing this one together. So I think I'm going to start with some of this really brilliant blue. Just kind of make it in the middle. It's just so smooth. I think I might do this. I haven't done this kind of purple maroon mauve. So now I'm just kind of coming in to the blue, covering the white, seeing how the paints react to each other on the paper. It's very pretty. It's so, it looks like three different colors. I love that. It's pretty, uh, you know what that actually looks like to me is, are those aerial photos of water. This looks like it has like coral reef or something underneath and it's just that very Cayman blue and then here's the sand. That's very pretty. I love how that looks. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to, I guess what I would consider my best paper. This is the Strathmore 140 pound cold press paper. And it ha it's really toothy. Because it's toothy, it does have an unusual texture when the paint hits it. So let me see what I think I'm gonna try the same blue and purple that I did on the stone hinge. So here we'll put in our underlying galaxy and you can even see on the paper the tooth. Add in some darker blues. This one I'm gonna try and keep the light. The light blue in there for just for a little bit of difference. Purpley mauve. Let's see how I want to get in here. So I'm curious to see how they mix together, but I also want to keep them at bay from each other, keep them apart in some certain areas. Oh gosh, see see how different that is? It's and it's just the paper. So all these colors I had just mixed up from the three colors that I had shown you earlier. The colors were a little unusual because the, the blue, yellow, and red that I had weren't true blue, red, and yellow. This was a cadmium red light, a cadmium yellow, and then the phthalo blue. So they were a little on their spectrum of the red, yellow, and blue. Okay, so we're gonna let these dry and then we'll come back and take, we'll remove the tape and kind of take a look at puffiness and the bendiness and the warp 
you know, how much they warp and things like that. So let's start where we started. So this was the Hansen Aquarelle 90 pound cold press paper. And you can see it definitely has some bumping going on. It's even kind of warped, you know, from here to here. This is the Canton 40 pounds, a little thicker. It still has gone up a little bit here. And what I notice on this is the paper coming through. Almost looks like it was kind of starting to wear. I don't know if it's the paint or the paper. It's kind of a cool effect, but if you weren't going for it, then it might be a little troublesome. This is the Stonehenge 40 pound cold press paper. Still a little wet here, but, and for some reason the Stonehenge is really, tape really took off the paper, which I never noticed that before. But the cold press and the hot press side by side don't really have, you know, a terrible amount of warping, a little bit here, you know, at the, at the bump right there, but nothing too dramatic. The colors I think blended a little bit better on the hot press. And then here we have the Strathmore. You can still really see those teeth, the the tooth in the paper. And it still, it also has a little bit of a bend here and a little bit of a pop up in the middle, but nothing major. So all in all, you can see, it really is about your preference, what you're going for, and the aesthetic that you find pleasing. I use all of these papers all of the time. If I'm if I know I'm going to have a fully wet piece, then I will choose a heavier duty or paper uh, just to help me out in the process. But generally for the types of things I do, the cards that I make, you know, sometimes I'm not using a lot of water with my paint and so this the bumpiness here isn't going to work, you know, isn't going to matter for me. But, you know, you do have to think about it too when you're putting this on a piece of cardstock as a card front. You know, you want it to seem substantial and presentable. Splurging for the 140 pound I think is worth it. But again, whatever gets you painting, you know, whatever's in your budget, whatever gets you doing art, practicing art every day, whether it's doing the 90 pound or using non-watercolor paper, whatever gets you practicing, it's just that it's going to give you more confidence and a better result if you use higher quality tools. So my recommendation is to buy a few high quality things instead of buying a bunch of inexpensive things that wind up not working out for you and you wind up spending the same amount of money that you would have if you had just invested in the right tool for the job to begin with. So I hope this helped. I enjoyed being with y'all tonight. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.